Well, everyone, welcome to this afternoon's panel on creating sustainable growth uh, in the Gulf as the world transitions to net zero. I gather that we are uh, competing with David Beckham uh, in this panel in another, in another venue. So, uh, uh, so we've definitely got the quality audience uh, uh, with us this afternoon. Um, I mean, for countries uh, in the Gulf that re rely heavily on hydrocarbons to fuel their economy, uh, the shift to net zero presents both, I would say, an opportunity uh, and a challenge. The challenge for Gulf countries to reduce their dependence on oil and gas uh, revenues, while at the same time diversifying uh, their economies, increasing productivity and creating sustainable growth uh, for future generations. That's the challenge. And it's why sustainable development and economic diversification uh, have become central to the national agendas of many uh, Gulf countries, including Qatar, in line with global efforts to decarbonize the world. Now, as part of this transition uh, to net zero, there are also ample uh, business opportunities, and I want to underline that. Uh, they include uh, green banking, agritech, uh, sustainable waste management, water resource management, advanced mobility, and environmental conservation. These are all business opportunities as well as must-haves uh, in order to head towards net zero. Encouraging these types of businesses can help pave the way uh, to uh, sustainable development and much needed diversification of Gulf economies. But it means that large-scale investment is needed in these and other areas. Um, free zones, like Qatar Free Zones, uh, who helped convene this panel, uh, for which thanks, they are playing a very important role in bringing uh, in international investors with products and technologies uh, that can support sustainable development in the GCC while bringing about diversification uh, of their own economies. And there are already many exciting things happening in areas from advanced mobility uh, to uh, alternative foods uh, and many others involving a growing number of businesses and organizations. Now, in this panel discussion that we're having this afternoon, we're going to explore what needs to be done to create sustainable growth in the Gulf. We will also explore how it can be done and the critical role that must be played by government, by innovation and uh, investment. And I'm very pleased to be joined this afternoon uh, by a distinguished panel to uh, discuss these uh, issues. Um, First of all, on my immediate left, uh, His Excellency Ahmad Al Sayed, the Minister of State and the Chairman uh, of Qatar Free Zones Authority. Uh, His Excellency is also Chairman and Managing Director of Doha Ventures Capital Fund, which is heavily involved in sustainable investment uh, with a very heavy ESG focus. Uh, he was first known to me and many others when he was chief executive of the QIA uh, and in his current role at Qatar Free Zones, he is playing a leading role in the effort to diversify Qatar's economy. Next is Amir Hussein, uh, founder and CEO of Spark Cognition, uh, which is a global leader in artificial intelligence solutions uh, for businesses across energy, manufacturing, 
transportation and logistics, financial services, as well as cyber security. Uh, Amir is a serial entrepreneur, uh, inventor, technologist, uh, but if that isn't enough, he's also the author of a best-selling book, uh, The Sentient Machine, The Coming Age of Artificial Intelligence. Ying Statton is head of corporate development at Plastic Energy. Uh, Ying is based in Singapore and leads Plastic Energy's corporate development in Asia, focusing on strategy, business development, and finance. Plastic Energy's technology enables circular recycling uh, of plastics via patented technology. And I should add, she's also a former colleague of mine at Global Council, where she advised uh, corporations on cross-border trade and investment in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Next is Ketan Patel, Chairman of Force for Good and CEO of Greater Pacific Capital. He leads Force for Good's efforts to engage with the world's global financial institutions in support of the UN Secretary General's roadmap for achieving sustainable development. He also co-founded Greater Pacific Capital, which invests in high-growth enterprises with the aim of making an impact locally and internationally through a focus on sustainability. And Steve Glickman, uh, Head of International at Aspiration. Aspiration is the sustainability services provider to Qatar a free zones authority. Uh, Aspiration supports over six million consumers uh, in the United States, as well as enterprises that want to reduce their carbon footprint uh, and to be environmentally sustainable. Uh, Steve is also founder and CEO of Develop, a boutique advisory firm. Uh, he's co-founder of STAT, a venture cat-backed enterprise software company. So those uh, are our panel. Uh, this afternoon. Let's open the discussion with a look then at a sort of helicopter view uh, of, of the current situation. The Gulf region currently provides 37% of global oil and 22% of global gas production. Petroleum and natural gas exports provide as much as 70 to 85% my God, of government revenue in some Gulf countries. Now, with those stark statistics in mind, I want to start with the fundamental question, if I may, of what it will actually take for Gulf economies to become sustainable as the world transitions to net uh, zero. Uh, it's a, a daunting challenge, and perhaps I could start with you, your Excellency, um, will you tell us, share us, share with us your views on what you think basically needs to be done? I mean, what do you think are the basic building blocks that need to be put in place uh, in order to get this um, transition right um, and sustainability going alongside it and diversification? in a country like Qatar. Uh, thank you, Peter, uh, for uh, being with us today. I would like to thank also um, our colleagues and the organizer for, for uh, giving us the opportunity. As you know, this is uh, an international topic. It's a very international topic uh, today and going forward. Um, Qatar in general and the rest of GCC, I think they, they put some undertaking uh, to cut their emission, you know, uh, big time, you know, uh, and that's been announced, you know, we are targeting 30% before 2030. And we also, we have it part of our uh, national vision 2030 uh, 30 target as one of the four pillars, you know, uh, to keep a, a health environment here, you know, and sustainable environment in the country. And this part of the economic diversification as well. So 
uh, it is at the heart of our focus. And the government announced their plan already end of uh, October. It's attended by the prime minister and an international undertaking has been um, uh, uh, provided there. Of course, you know, to go to net zero, it's a global uh, debate on the timeline of going there. And, you know, if there is agreement, you know, from even big power, uh, whether China, America, and India, and the other country. However, I think uh, the GCC is taking, you know, a different initiatives here, even uh, the Saudis um, uh, announced, you know, uh, their initiative for the Green uh, Middle East, and then different initiatives being taken seriously here. If you go to the economy by itself, you know, it's a very similar situation among the different GCC country here. The commodity, by fact, is the uh, biggest resource, which we are uh, thankful to God by having this. And I think the more I think about it is, you know, how to deploy and to sustain this resources, you know, and how to improve the technology to make it even greener. You know, so we are in Qatar, we are lucky to have the gas, which is, you know, much cleaner than the uh, fissile oil, you know. However, I think in the best interest of the GCC to deploy also a lot of investment in the R&D to sustain this, you know, resources on the long term. To keep the current economy to move to a transition, there is a dual objective here, I think. You know, it's A, to make sure that economically sustainable, the transition, so you are moving more toward a knowledge-based economy. And second, we need to ensure that all the new companies, or you know, it depends how resources we are allocating to attract a new business or to establish a new cluster to be environmentally sustainable. So uh, I think going forward, and that's our focus in the free zone. The free zone, for example, we are thinking about tomorrow, and we are you know uh, lining up with different partners like Aspiration to make sure the business for tomorrow will be green will be sustainable, and we are targeting to be a carbon neutral free zone, and that's been, we made it public. Uh, the second, it's to make sure that uh, uh, every country, you know, uh, re-emphasize that the diversification and the environment, sustainable environmental, you know, uh, business is part of their national strategy, which I think, you know, uh, most of the state, however, uh, the thing that we should avoid here, to remind ourselves every time, with the oil price going up, you know, there is good surplus happen with the budget. So I hope we will not forget, you get my point, to focus and to continue emphasize on the importance of the diversification here while we are seeing their surplus. And, and, and Qatar, to be frank with you, is lucky enough to focus and to put, you know, a specific resources, even the QIA is part of the one plant. So we are really allocating resources to make it, you know, um, uh, uh, tangible here. Uh, the third pillar is the infrastructure. We are investing in infrastructure and we need to make sure, you know, the infrastructure that we are building for tomorrow, it's enabler for the green, you know, economy and for more, more sustainability, you know, than the classical old infrastructure. So government is providing the policy framework, building the infrastructure and providing some of the capital, but you look to the private sector to provide the dynamic Absolutely. and the technology which, to, which you harness together. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, essential building blocks. Now, the rest of the panel, let me turn to each of you and ask you just for one, one idea, not a series of building blocks, but one idea that you think uh, would contribute significantly to sustainable economic diversification. Thank you. Uh, I think His Excellency makes a, a tremendous uh, set of wonderful points. I think a knowledge-based economy is the future for sure. Uh, but perhaps uh, I'll add to that by saying that in the moment there is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, if you think about the types of things that drive the most value uh, in the global economy now, they're generally intellectual property-based, highly repeatable products. If you think about Apple or if you think about Microsoft or you think about companies of that nature, 
uh, why are they as highly valued as they are? Because at the fundamental core of their business, they have differentiated IP that's productized, that absent the number of people working in their company can still drive a huge amount of revenue for them. So if we know that that is the type of asset that has value in future, how do we bring that to the free zone? How do we bring that to Qatar? How do we bring that to Doha? Most of that is enabled by software innovation, and that's what I've spent my entire life doing, building software companies. And I can tell you that there is a shift underway in how software is built. The model of venture capitalists putting money in a company and multiple rounds going by and equity being distributed, this is being disrupted somewhat by a new model where developers mostly own what they do, the crypto model, where people can own tokens in projects that they contribute to. But because crypto is new as a way of financing, it's very hard to find jurisdictions where large, serious projects of this type can really take off. Singapore and Switzerland are two such places that are really doing good work uh, in this area. But I think Qatar should be the most serious and perhaps third temporally, but number one in terms of its commitment and in terms of the strength with which it enables crypto-powered companies to come in to the free zone and innovate. This to me is not just a regulation that ensures that lots of very exciting companies will end up in the free zone. It also ensures that the best human capital that's committed to building these businesses will come and live in Qatar. And that kind of uh, dissemination of knowledge and that kind of interaction with the local ecosystem and that kind of okay. enriching of the free zone, I think will be a game changer. So that's so your, one idea. So your idea is innovative software and armies of software engineers. Armies of software engineers powered by crypto. Very good. Ying, what's your idea? Thank you, Peter. Um, and to give some context to my comments, maybe I'll start with just a few words about plastic energy. Uh, we are a British company, um, and we are the market leader in the advanced recycling of end-of-life plastic waste. And by that I mean we can take mixed contaminated plastic waste that's been commingled with household waste, and through a proprietary process, we turn it back into a recycled oil that can be used as a substitute for virgin fossil fuel directly in petrochemical, existing petrochemical infrastructure to make recycled plastics with exactly the same properties as virgin plastic. Uh, my big idea um, is around the circular economy. Um, and here's the context. I think notwithstanding the current disruption uh, and, and medium-term disruption to energy markets uh, caused by what's happening in, in Ukraine, over the coming decades, what we'll see is that overall, the demand for hydrocarbons as a fuel is declining, but that is being more than offset by the increase in demand for hydrocarbons as a feedstock to make plastic. And that demand for plastic is directly correlated to demographic growth and to GDP growth. And if you think about it, plastic is, is completely fundamental to modern life. From the PPE and the masks that we've all become so accustomed to during the pandemic, to the plastic packaging that helps to extend the shelf life of food, and the sachets of soap that are improving health and uh, sanitation outcomes in remote islands in, in Indonesia. It's very difficult to think of an alternative material that has the same qualities as plastic with a lower environmental footprint. The problem is the current model that we have, which is a linear one that involves taking, making, and then disposing of the plastic. The majority of the plastic products that we use, we use once, and then it gets, ends up being dumped in a landfill, burned in an incinerator, or at worst, leaking into the ocean, where it sticks around for hundreds of years. So by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And at the same time, here in the Gulf and around the world, we're extracting more virgin fossil fuels every single day to feed the world's appetite for plastic. So my idea is, what if we could decouple the production of plastic from the extraction of virgin fossil fuels? And that is exactly what we've been working on at Plastic Energy uh, for the last 10 years. Um, and to be frank, I think that the hydrocarbon industry and hydrocarbon-rich 
um, states, like those in the GCC, have a really important role to play, and they can be part of the solution. And that's because the circular economy presents an opportunity for the hydrocarbon industry to diversify and transform um, and reduce the dependence on, on virgin fossil fuels. It also helps them to make the best use and extend the life of existing infrastructure, existing physical and human capital, and put that to use. Uh, and, and then thirdly, it gives you an opportunity to, to radically tackle the problem of plastic pollution, um, which is one that we're all facing um, around the world. So that is my idea. Okay. Thank you. Peter. So revolutionary waste management and in the process deal with all the ghastly plastic. Absolutely. Okay, brilliant. Ketten? Um, Thank you. Um, God, some interesting ideas come out already. So I would, I would, I'm going to step above it and say the question is about the Gulf. And I think the big idea was the GCC that was potentially the EU of the world. And I think it, with the big macro geopolitical changes going in the world, there are four power blocks that are emerging, the US, the EU, um, India, and China. India will take some time, but the growth rate seems to be there and the population is certainly there. The fifth should have been and should be really the Gulf, um, but that requires a sense of unity, common purpose, a willingness to give up some level of autonomy to work together for, a, for an economic trade and monetary union. And I think the last few years demonstrate that's very tough to do. And we've seen the challenges in the EU too. Um, and so that would be the, the real answer, but I would suggest that uh, some of the biggest trends now are that technology and information is transforming the world and making um, it easier to reach populations you could not reach before and to reach them profitably. And the movement of fintech, I think, is, is something that I could see the Gulf actually embracing. Um, we have financial centers now spread all across the Gulf. None of these, though, amount to something that could rival a New York or a London uh, or a Beijing even. Uh, and the future, probably not even a Mumbai, given the scale of, of that country. So my thought would be um, financial inclusion, almost mass financial inclusion, using technology. And this country has, uh, this region and this country too, have the capital certainly, have the access to technology, are already investors in some of the most exciting fintech businesses around the world. So if they took those and scaled fintech, I think this country and this region could be a driver of mass financial inclusion. As is happening already in some African countries. It is, yeah, and it's just not at the scale it needs yeah. to be, but I think the technology is now there, and it can be done profitably okay. because these are very bespoke solutions. Okay. Uh, they're scalable. I want to come back to finance, not financial inclusion, but green finance in a moment, if I may, and I'm going to come back to you, Ketan, on, sure. on that. But Steve, your idea. Well, let me give you an early transition opportunity. I think what we need to do is we need to translate climate justice, which I'll unpack quickly, into an asset class. And I think that's already happening. So what is climate justice? Very simply, it's the obligation that countries and regions that have benefited from fossil fuel production, the US, China, the Gulf, have to invest in countries that are most at risk as a result of climate change. And one very straightforward way to do that is to invest in the rebuilding of the natural ecosystems in the global south. So these are forests and jungles in South America and Central America and Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, all places at the greatest risk from climate change. Just as oil and gas production was commoditized and sold and has a market and as um, His Excellency pointed out is now rapidly inflating in price, so are carbon credits which are the now commoditized asset that comes from large-scale investments in not just, but, but predominantly these days, nature-based reforestation projects. So that the benefit is not, there's no longer a marketing benefit for companies. Increasingly, it goes to their deficits uh, on their carbon accounting, which two years ago didn't mean anything. This year in the US, the, the SEC has just announced they're requiring public disclosures, mandatory disclosures of the carbon footprint of every public company. And increasingly, you're going to see regulators come behind it and uh, provide penalties for companies that don't meet their public net zero commitments. 
Increasingly then, you create a, both a, 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 a stick but also a carrot to make large-scale long-term investments because these carbon credits have now become an asset that can sit on corporate balance sheets, not just to reduce the regulatory risk, but also to invest in what's now a greatly inflating asset. The FT reported in January that nature-based carbon credit pricing between June of last year and January of this year went up 300%. No coincidence because last year was a breakthrough year in the demand for carbon credits because of the huge increase in net zero commitments. So this transition of the mor morally doing the right thing as a country in the world to this being a, an investment opportunity for both countries, financial institutions, big asset managers, I think could change the game in how quickly, and I know we're all, we're all gonna focus on this, on how quickly we make this transition. Okay, well, I think that when you talk of carrots and sticks, central to that is finance. So let me talk to you both, if you don't mind. Uh, first, Ketan, and then again you, Steve, about uh, um, the global interest in green finance and impact uh, investing and whether it's taking off, helping, hurting uh, this region. What does the Gulf need to do in your view in order to be competitive in, in a world where green financing, uh, green finance is becoming increasingly important? Ketan? That's, that's a... That's a tough one too, because um, for, from my position looking uh, as the chairman of Force for Good, we analyze the flow of capitals across the world and what financial institutions are doing, the top 100 financial institutions in the world, which, who represent about $170 trillion. Uh, out of the $400 trillion or so of capital in the world that is gross and liquid and available. Um, all of them, all of the 100 we've looked at, um, have agreed uh, an ESG criteria that effectively screens, excludes certain kinds of investments. So these are meant to exclude carbon investments, so new carbon investments. Um, countries and companies that, that transgress human rights, um, don't respect diversity and so on. It's quite a long list that they've effectively arrived at independently, then collaborated on and is, is a list of exclusions. If you apply that list to um, a company um, that is an oil producer, ultimately you have to exclude it from your portfolio. And they're all committed to doing so. So if you apply it to a country, I think, you end up excluding a country from your portfolio. So, so the Gulf is on the wrong side of the track so in all this? I would say so. I would say that in the sweep of history where we're headed to now, there is a broad consensus that we have to make a transition. The speed of that transition is unclear. But actually, there's a lot of pressure to make sure it's 2050. And there's a lot of pressure to make sure that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are met by 2030. Now, that needs something like, to just to meet the UN Development Goals, which include climate change. Uh, the estimates that John Kerry spoke of earlier, in the, earlier yesterday was that the shortfall is 25 to $40 trillion by 2030. We've, kept, we've recalculated that number for the pandemic and for the, the misery it's caused around the world. And the number is closer to $100 trillion of shortfall. So where is the opportunity for the Gulf and for the rich states in the Gulf, obviously, who have deep pockets and have, have, are going to add to those deep pockets given the crises we now see in Europe for energy? So I would say the massive opportunity is for the Gulf to start to fund the sustainable development goals themselves. Okay. So that puts them on the right side of it. Absolutely, I think this is a switch which no country is ready to do. No region has actually grasped and it's a complete transformation. So if you want to be forgiven for having the energy source that is becoming the number one cigarette now that people have to give up as a habit and you want to switch to the right side of history, I think you fund the UN sustainable development goals as the champion and therefore the world will be on your side. Okay. And you'll get the transition rights to actually figure out how to do it. And that's the deal I think that needs to be struck. Okay, it, that sounds like a very, very interesting and viable deal potentially. Steve, tell me why has Aspiration chosen Qatar and the Gulf as your nearest international location 
I mean, what's your view on this, uh, on this issue? So we've had a long-term sustainability business. Our, our company is 10 years old. We were probably one of the earliest U.S. online financial institutions that had all green financial products from the get-go, fossil fuel-free investment in retirement accounts, um, a, a large tree planting program, carbon offsetting built into our products. The thing about net zero, if you peel back the onion, and I think it's what makes it controversial, although not controversial to us, is that net zero is an admission that we're going to forgive whatever past sins got us to this place, and we're going to make commitments of, about how we're going to go forward. And net zero in and of itself is essentially just a tool to structure long-term investments, whether it's in renewable energy or it's carbon reduction or it's in carbon removal technology or carbon removal investments via nature-based um, uh, mechanisms. And we're a big, on, you know, in our global business, we're a big nature-based investor and supplier of carbon credits. It's how we, you're going to make these big investments now. And I think the key, the reason we came here, and I think the key for the Gulf and really for the world going forward, is how fast do we start to make these investments for two reasons. One, because many of these investments will take years and years and years to develop until they, they have the scale necessary to achieve our shared, shared goals. If you're investing in new scale reforestation, you don't see carbon renew, removal at scale from those projects for 10 years because trees have to grow. They don't start capturing carbon immediately. If you're investing in technology-based carbon sequestration, there are no projects that exist now that can do it at scale. It is, 50, it is 30 times more expensive for companies to invest in it than nature-based credits. So you need scale to bring down the cost, and that's going to take years and years and years. And, the, and the, the concern that everyone shares is we do not have years and years and years. If we invested today, maybe we could hit 20, 30 targets, maybe at scale. We're almost for sure going to miss them, almost for sure. The question is, do we invest at a time scale to ensure we, we don't miss the 2050 target? Because if we miss the 2015 target, the scale of destruction the world may face may totally change the conversations we have in this room two decades from now. It's not a question of will we invest in green finance, it's a question of can we survive for 20 more years. And if you believe, if, if people in this room and people across the world say that they believe the scientists, that the scientists are in total agreement that in 30 years, if temperature rises by two degrees more, we're all going to die then we have to start making those investment decisions now. And so okay. the Gulf, as a wealthy part of the world that's benefited from fossil fuels, has this unique opportunity to change the narrative of what the Gulf is about by leading with these types of investments. And I think you, you're starting to see that, not just in Qatar, but also in UAE and Saudi, where the political forces seem to be pushing in that direction. The question is, will the commercial and investment so, forces so follow? So basically, you have to do it early, and you have to do it for the long term. And, and there's an opportunity to, to, for the Gulf to be the leader right. in, in doing it now. OK, Your Excellency. The Gulf can be a leader. So what is Qatar doing in relation to green investing? And how, how do you deploy a Doha Ventures capital yeah. fund um, to support your green investment? Um, first of all, I think, you know, it's a very interesting debate here, but you have to understand and the reality is the Gulf is part of global initiative, and it should be global in it, initiatives. The biggest industrial part is not in the Gulf. It's in China, in the United States, in Europe, uh, you know, and India. So without a cooperation between all these, you get my point, uh, uh, big pocket, let me put it this way, industrial big pocket, the Gulf itself cannot go uh, anywhere. And the Gulf also is facing the diversification need because at the end, we need to reduce the reliance on the oil and gas. You know, it's, uh, the gas is more longer term transition. It's much clearer, but you know, uh, there is a lot of, of things here need to be considered to be also fair and balanced. However, uh, regarding your uh, you know, question, Peter, I think you know, uh, already Qatar and maybe other, other Gulf states already investing in the green, already deploying money, making international commitment in the green. We are at um, DVC here and uh, the free zone, uh, QFZ. You know, uh, the green and the sustainability is uh, one of our main 
target. That's why at early stage we came and partner with Aspiration. And, you know, Aspiration is our key partner now in making the ESG and, you know, uh, to, to be more sustainable in carbon tutoring, uh, you know, and the offset a program that they are providing. Also, they are advising us, not only as an institution, also our companies, to how we reach that, uh, you know, uh, 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 neutron uh, uh, point here. So uh, we deployed money with them. We deployed also money with the, the technology or, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the food alternative. It just, uh, as a new technology, clean, we also did in mobility. We team up with Yutong and Gosan, the French and the Chinese, and the electric buses and vehicles. So we focus really on bringing uh, a partners, a strategic partner that focus on tomorrow, making the world more sustainable and you know, a cleaner from uh, a carbon point of view. So uh, the money that we are putting, in addition to the infrastructure that we are putting in the country, like Sherp downtown, it's, you know, when a lot of prices internationally for their sustainability. So Qatar is doing a lot, you know, um, uh, especially with the modern infrastructure to focus a, on more advanced, more sustainable infrastructure that will stay and will serve, you know, private sector and international, including international investment here in Qatar. You know, we have modern infrastructure, we have big data, you know, uh, we have advanced, you know, and advanced mobility and uh, egg tech, agro tech, health tech. That's our main focus in DVC as a venture and uh, Qatar free zone and Qatar in general. So uh, I think our people are doing a lot and we are continue committed to do more, you know, and, and more uh, green investment and sustainability. In addition to QIA, you know, uh, my information that also they are committed and founder of the one plant initiatives and they continue investing in a green you know there is you know also still a green uh, you know these days and you know it's the technology is evolving yes but also to allocate the right resources we need a global cooperation you know between the top r d um, powerhouses and the financial institutions and the government here to be there to reach, you know, the target and, uh, you know, that we want to go for carbon neutral. So a partnership between innovation pioneers and those taking up new technology, plus government, plus sources of finance, sure. an essential partnership. Let, let me drill down a little further into the subject of innovation um, and, uh, and technologies, given that we've got a couple of members of our panel. Um, who are appropriate to put this to and that about the role that technologies play in helping to build a sustainable economy. Uh, Amir, you are um, a world-recognized authority on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's potential to solve the most you know, pressing needs that we uh, 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 face in the world uh, and how it can be applied to business is a very, very exciting challenge and opportunity uh, uh, for us. Um, how do you see the role of technologies broadly, but artificial intelligence in particular, in driving this uh, uh, um, challenge of, of creating sustainable development. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, at Spark Cognition, our whole focus has been on actually building things and deploying them in the real world and using AI to make a difference in the physical world. You can use AI to build photo filters. You can use AI to optimize a link ad on a website. What we like to do is actually build things that exist in the real world and improve people's lives. Uh, and in that category of things, there's a huge list that I think really well applies to the Gulf. So to give you an example, we've been working with a really, really large cement pr plant uh, in Pakistan, and we have helped them use artificial intelligence models to cut down their power consumption on their extremely large unit. In fact, they have a 40 megawatt plant that the, the, the operator of the cement plant owns just to provide that one unit with the electricity that they need. So we've demonstrated that AI in these large-scale manufacturing processes can cut down electric consumption. If that's the case, 
how can desalination as an example be made uh, less expensive and more effective just one example another challenge that from a sustainability standpoint particularly in the backdrop of ukraine there's a lot of debate around cybersecurity qatar is a small country it's a skilled country but a small country and Qatar has a tremendous amount of physical infrastructure associated with its oil and gas and all the modern systems of trains, planes, automobiles, etc. That, that exist in Qatar. How will these systems be defended? You can't really have, you can't marshal huge numbers of cybersecurity professionals to go through these types of tasks manually. So, for example, we've partnered with Siemens and we've implemented AI cyber capability that lives inside these industrial systems and uh, they're protected and your output, your factories, your, your aviation, your logistics are protected. I'll give you a third example. Um, you know, if you look at, so for example, water management. Uh, we've been working with one of the world's largest beverage companies and in the US this is driven a lot by um, essentially, um, you know, th th uh, competitions between companies and also a mandate by the federal government as to how much water you can waste when you produce a beverage. So if you're a big soda manufacturer, uh, year on year, how are you reducing water waste? And so we've implemented artificial intelligence in now multiple plants there to reduce wastewater. And we've got over two years tremendous results that come from that. Now, each one of the things that I've described, even going all the way back to the opener here in terms of bringing people in, using regulation to bring people in, ultimately, um, the one consistent force through man's history over five, 10,000 years that's caused uh, a betterment universally in living conditions, that one force is technology. And here are four examples of how artificial intelligence and, and crypto-powered software ecosystems, et cetera, can be brought to Qatar to solve problems that are not hypothetical, but the problems that exist today around water and energy and okay. sustainability. The question is, how can we bring these things here? And that, I think, is a, a slightly longer topic, but I know that His Excellency and their team are working on this day and night. And for example, the regulatory framework, the integration with foreign centers of thought that can be invited and brought in here. Uh, I had the privilege of spending some time with His Excellency's team and I know they're on it. And this is why I'm so excited. Can AI and can crypto and can next gen software and exponential technologies change the face of this economy? Absolutely, okay. no question in my mind. Okay, Ying, I want to ask you, and then I'm going to come to His Excellency to respond. What are the factors, I mean, with your technology company, what are the factors that would encourage you or attract you to come to the Gulf, to come to Qatar? Uh, and then I'm going to put those to uh, the chairman. And by the way, um, we're going, I'm going to turn it over to the audience, uh, all of you, to ask your own questions in the final 10 minutes you have. So, uh, so be prepared. Uh, but Ying, what would bring you to the Gulf? What would bring you to Qatar? I want to touch on a point that you were making earlier, Peter, and, and which His Excellency made just now, um, which is around the interplay of technology and public policy. So I think that in any sector uh, driven by sustainability, ultimately what shapes and drives the development of technologies and of businesses like plastic energy is public policy and political will. So if you take a, a problem like plastic pollution, for instance, it, the, the problem is not really with, with, to do with technology or even to do with plastic itself, but it's to do with waste management. So if you take a plastic bottle or a plastic bag or a package and you put it in a dedicated bin and you collect enough of it, the technology to recycle it is actually not that complicated. The problem is that in most parts of the world that doesn't happen. The plastic gets mixed up with food and, and liquid and, and soil and other types of waste. And by that point, it becomes very difficult and expensive to extract the plastic and to clean it in order to recycle it. And at that point, the only thing you can do is to dump it in the landfill, burn it in an incineration plant, or, or at worst, let it leak into the ocean. 
And to be frank, what are the incentives for households and waste management companies uh, to go the extra mile and incur the extra cost of segregating their plastic from the rest of waste and recycling it when the cheapest option is to dump it in a landfill or when the landfill is free? And that's where public policy comes in because public policy is what can change those incentives and, and help to change behaviors to make sustainable businesses possible. Um, and so, you know, one example is that the EU is really the leader in, in this field of, of, of waste management. And over the last decade, it's introduced a tranche of uh, circular economy policies. For example, banning plastic from landfill and extended producer responsibility schemes that put the onus back on the producers of plastic to collect it and to recycle it. And the EU and other countries like the EU, UK have also introduced measures on the demand side. Um, for example, introducing legislation on minimum recycle content of packaging uh, and introducing a tax on virgin plastic packaging. And all of these measures help to create demand for the product that, that we're making. And, and just yesterday, I was hearing from uh, the Minister of Environment here in Qatar that Qatar also has uh, an ambition to uh, achieve zero landfill and, and zero waste. And so these are exactly the types of policies that make it possible for businesses okay. like ours um, to, to come uh, to, to, a, to a country and, and to build a viable business. Chairman, you've already had a lot of success in Qatar in attracting technology-driven uh, new businesses. But what Ying is saying is it needs you know, the whole system <laughs> to be designed uh, for, for a a sustainable solution such as the one that she's describing to fit into it's one thing attracting the business it's quite another creating the system here uh, which the business can serve do you think that you're doing that in Qatar do you think the systems are being created quickly enough uh, I think the system is already uh, putting it in a place so uh, what we are doing here you know, in addition to what Qatar can give you, you know, from top advance in the infrastructure, uh, enabling, you know, um, advanced opportunity, big players. And the QFZ here, uh, once you join us, you are our partner, a true partner. And the true partner is not per se, you know, true partner, it's real partner who will give you and will enable you from regulatory point of view. So that can put advanced regulations to deal with your future business. It's partner for tomorrow. I'm not talking about legacy business. I'm talking about partnering for good, partnering for tomorrow. Regulatory from enabling, logistically enabling, and financially enable you and connect you, not only locally, neither regionally, but even globally with our network. So that's the difference that, you know, when we have the business development team, just not to show you you have this land or we can allocate you here. No, they are working with you to enable you to open doors, to, you know, fill the gaps in your business, you know. At, and today, I met with Roya, you know, who discussed, you know, at the robotic yesterday. I told her, I'm happy to provide you with all facility that you, know, you need and to make your um, uh, business, you know, uh, real things. And we already connected, uh, connect here with uh, one of our big investors, uh, Robotic. So this partnership is important and this partnership is what we are uh, providing to the world. Let me, in the few minutes that we have left, let me just turn it over to uh, you, participants. Let me see where anyone would care to make a point or ask a question. Let's start over the, here. Thanks. Is there anyone else? Just could you please indicate? There's another one over here. Right. Start here. Go there and come here. Oh, no. Hold on. You're, you're overwhelming me. Quick, have to be very quick. Yeah, very quick. So my name is Santiago Bañales. I am managing director of a company here in Qatar that actually develops artificial intelligence for the energy sector and part of Iberdrola, a global energy group. And I like a lot your intervention, uh, Amir Hussein, about how artificial intelligence over development can enable this transformation. And I have a question for you that is always on my mind, which is, if this transformation is based on this IP develop in this crypto power and other technologies that you mentioned, is based on that, this transformation is going to benefit mainly the people owning these assets. So my, my question is, how can we make this transformation benefit everyone? I mean, how can we impact 
equality in the sense that, you know, everyone gets the benefits of this transformation of software and artificial intelligence. Who wants to pick that up? I mean, is that for me? Yeah, it okay. can be, but very quickly. Okay, yes, okay. So I think uh, fundamentally, you know, you have um, people that have invested in the project, they are beneficiaries. People that are developing and building that project, they are beneficiaries. And then uh, in a lot of these token projects, you can actually distribute part of the token reserve to whoever you want. So as an example, if you wanted to benefit a particular community because the project was aligned for or built by that community, you could do so. You could do distributions of token rewards to target communities. There's a built-in mechanism to do that. Okay, thank you. Next question over here. As quickly as you can, if you will. Uh, just to, to bring in the idea of the leadership of the corporations that will play their part in this transition. Do, do we need a fresh focus on corporate governance so that our corporations are led in a way that can achieve the differences that have been described so that their, their reference point is no longer simply financial and directed to Good. investor yeah. return? Qu quick response, if you will. So, so um, today's system is organized, as you know, for shareholders to have the say. And although there's a commitment to move to stakeholders, that is not measured or rewarded. It's starting to get rewarded because actually the most powerful player is the individual. And the individual has demonstrated their power in politics. And I think the next wave they'll demonstrate it in business. And people who don't make that shift will, will be turfed out. But, I, uh, but as to whether we can do that from the outside, on a mandatory basis, I don't know. But I, I think the shift is underway. Um, and it's, it's a big shift, and they see it coming too. So there, there is a voluntary shift happening as of today. Thank you very much. Gentlemen here, just over there. Here, yep. there you go. No, there? right here. Well done. Yeah. Okay. Very quickly, uh, though. Yeah, uh, my name is Fidel Insley, but I'm uh, a rural community organizer. Uh, uh, my question is uh, two part. The, uh, the first is to his Excellency, um, if I clearly understood uh, your uh, the first part of your presentation, you you, <clears throat> you gave an impression that uh, Qatar is way way ahead of the rest of other oil producing countries in, in terms of you know decarbonizing the economies and. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to know if there is any area of uh, cooperation between you and other um, uh, uh, oil producing countries, especially in Africa, you know. In some countries, they are not even talking about, I mean, okay. oil producing Can countries. I cut you off here because you okay. asked a very good question. Okay. You're going to get a quick response. Yeah, uh, I didn't say we are ahead, but we said, I said, you know, we are very focused and uh, we announce a target and commitment publicly and we are working collectively to achieve this target. So and that's, you know, publicly there. So that's a public undertaking. Thank you. Last question over here. My, my name is Navdeep Suri. Question is for Mr. Ketan Patel. Um, in the rush for meeting ESG norms, uh, is there a danger of greenwashing? And are we evolving standards to prevent greenwashing? Because you keep hearing stories of companies pretending to do good, but actually not. The quick answer is I, I think there's always a danger. And in the early phase, everyone's innovating and therefore coming up with their own solutions and probably making it up as they go along, right? So, of course, there's some faking and there's some greenwashing. But I think the, the largest institutions have high-quality individuals in place who believe in the mission and therefore are, are if you like, the, the advocates who are changing that to something very real. And so the amount of capital now being deployed in that is increasingly being deployed to do something real that will make a true impact, I believe. And I think it's directionally right. And the EU is setting legal ground rules, and the US is beginning to do that too, to make sure that these things ultimately will be audited and people will be accountable for those results. And that's the direction, I think. Thank it's you very, positive. very much indeed. And last question here. Yeah, I have a question for Steve. Uh, I noticed the focus is all on infrastructure and technology. How can we develop like a global regulation to incentivize the industry? like what you mentioned, Yang. 
instead of penalizing? Because I, I think you mentioned about penalties and RECs, so I need to know how we can develop you know, regulations to incentivize the industry as well as the community. Thank you. It's a, it's a good question. I think there's a risk in, there's an opportunity and risk in regulation. The biggest concern I have is that companies are too afraid to make any decisions now, and so their default is not to invest at all. And the regulations always create uncertainty that will, I think, delay that investment, and we need lots of investment now. The good news is there are ways to create sticks and carrots. So, for example, disclosure, transparency everywhere is a, is a really good way to get companies and countries focused on, for example, their carbon footprint, how they're evaluating the different scopes of it, and that's how they're setting public targets that make them accountable to them. And then the market really is formed behind it, and you've seen this happen now, where there's, uh, there's now a market-based incentive to start to make these investments on the back end of it, because the longer you wait to invest, it's not just a moral issue, it's also a real economic and business question for companies that now may be looking at a, let's call it a hundred million dollar a year cost they have to fill. Ten years from now, that will be a billion dollar a year cost they have to fill. And 30 years from now, that will be a ten billion dollar a year cost they have to fill if they wait to invest. And so this mar the market that's sucking up the supply of in this transition of renewable energy, of carbon credits, of technology-based sequestration is under really attacked by this new market-based demand from all of these net zero targets. Regulators should make sure those net zero targets are real, that they're transparent, and that they're actionable, and I think the market will take care of the rest. Well, I think what this discussion has shown is that the, uh, this transition to a low-carbon future is very, very exciting. We've heard plenty of ideas and considerable uh, ambition from the panel uh, this afternoon. Absolutely clear that neither government alone nor the private sector alone can do this and achieve and pull off what needs to be done. It requires a partnership, and in a country like Qatar, it requires, as like other countries in the Gulf, it requires a considerable foreign direct investment in which Qatar free zones are playing an absolutely essential uh, role, Your Excellency. So thank you very much uh, indeed, everyone, uh, for coming in what has been an excellent panel. Steve, Ketan, Yik, Ying, Amir, Your Excellency, thank you very much indeed.